guides who are going to be making their way down. And just raise your hand if, if you need a Bible. And go ahead and open up your Bible to James chapter 3. Been teaching through the book of James in student ministries and in my small group as well. And as I've had occasion to preach, it's what I've been drawn to. And for better or for worse, on Sunday morning when I preach it, uh, you're getting three preps worth of passion and conviction and God's work in my own life from this book. And maybe over the next two years, we'll actually, in our main service, have made it all the way through the book of James also. This morning, we're going to be in chapter three, and what we're going to do is we're going to spend this week and next week looking at what God has to say about our speech, about our speech. And there's no more, no greater, consistent, no more penetrating evidence of your need and of my need for grace than our speech. While the number of words the average person speaks in a day varies greatly and can depend on age and culture and other factors, a recent University of Arizona study found that most people speak around, around 16,000 words a day. Now, it's true some much less, and it's true some much more. But on average, the typical person speaks around 16,000 words in a day. To put that in perspective, that's 112,000 words a week or 480,000 words per month. This year, the average person will speak 5,840,000 words. And we are accountable before God for every single one. We are communicative creations. Our world revolves around speech. Those statistics were just considering verbal communication, much less nonverbal communication, much less in the day that we live, social media communication. And there's nothing that argues stronger for my need of grace, for my need of rescue, for my need of forgiveness from God than what comes out of my mouth. Think for just a moment. How would you feel if every word that came from your mouth was played audibly for us from the last month this morning? What about this last week? What if we just played audibly every word you spoke this last week? What about this morning? Our world of talk is a world of trouble. Each one of us struggles with our tongue. The hasty word, the proud word, the selfish word, the manipulative flattery, slanderous word, gossip, innuendo, doubt, impure words, rebellious words, self-aggrandizement, thoughtless words, on and on and on. The catalog of possibilities for trouble with our tongue seems endless. And the reality is that you and I do not have the autonomous power to solve this problem. We have a word problem. We have speech problems. And our only hope is in God. God's grace has to be present in our lives. Because if we are left to our speech moment by moment, if we are left to ourselves in our speech, and if his grace can't reach us, if it can't tend to us in our need as it pertains to our speech, then we're utterly lost and we have no hope. And the reality of the damage that we can do with our tongue, it must be sobering. In fact, it it must be terrifying for us. Yet conversely, with our speech, we have a unique and tremendous opportunity. We can bless God. 
we can encourage one another. We can spur each other on. You see, the goal should not be to merely restrain ourselves from ever speaking, but rather we should desire and we should earnestly seek to use our speech to be pleasing to the Lord, to be honoring to God. And as hard as what we're going to hear from God's word this week and next is, you ought to hear these words not as a cold, distant instruction, but you must hear this instruction regarding our speech as an expression of transcendent love for you. God is invested in your holiness. He cares and he provides and he has provided all that you need, all that I need, all that we need to be able to honor him in every conversation, in every word. Of the 5,840,000 words that we might speak this year, we have the opportunity in Christ, we have been enabled and have at our disposal the grace, the necessary means to please him with every single one. This is great love. He cares, he provides, he has provided all that we need. And it matters to God, not only what you say when everyone is watching He cares about the private word spoken to your spouse. Child, he cares about the words muttered in response to a displeasing instruction from your parents. He's powerful enough to hear and know every single word, and he's loving enough to tend to us and give us the means to honor him in every single word. What grace. Well, this morning we're going to be looking at James chapter 3, verses 1 through the first half of verse 5, and then next week we'll pick up the rest through verse 12. But let's read together James 3, verses 1 through 12. So we'll read all 12 verses this morning, and then we'll address this morning the first five. James 3, verse 1. Let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that as such we will incur a stricter judgment, for we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well. Now, if we put the bits into the horse's mouths so that they will obey us, we direct their entire body as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so great and are driven by strong winds and are still directed by a very small rudder, whatever the inclination of the pilot desires. So also the tongue is a small part of the body and yet it boasts of great things. That's our passage for this morning. And then reading on, see how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire And the tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life and is set on fire by hell. For every species of beasts and birds, of reptiles and creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by the human race, but no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come both blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be this way. Does a fountain send out from the same opening both fresh and bitter water? Can a fig tree, my brethren, produce olives or a vine produce figs? Nor can salt water produce fresh. Let's pray. God, as we come to your word this morning, I pray that we would see beyond the words on a page and we would see the God who authored these words. Pray that we would see you once again behind your instruction. 
that we would recognize your care and your love and your grace. That we would recognize our need for those things as well in our own sinfulness and that we would be quick to want to conform our speech to that which is pleasing to you. We need your help. Help us to see what we must be encouraged by pertaining to your grace in our lives. and Help us to see where we need to grow still more. I pray that our desire for all of these things would be for your glory and your honor. And we pray in Christ's name, amen. Well, the book of James, as I've discussed before, contains some of the most practical instruction for the Christian life. And what we see in the book of James is what should be characteristics of the Christian. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ and you want to know what this newness of life should look like, how should God's work in your life, how should God's grace in your life manifest itself outwardly? Well, the book of James is a great book to provide specific, tangible, practical applications for how to live in a way that is pleasing to the Lord. James puts forth the righteous life that God desires for those who follow him. You see, our obedience is not a means, as, we dis- as we've discussed many times, our obedience is not a, a means to entrance into salvation. Salvation is by faith alone, through grace alone. It is solely the work of God and what he has accomplished in his son, Jesus Christ, in bearing the weight of our sin and the wrath that we deserved in our sin upon the cross And then giving to us a righteousness that is not our own and taking from us the wrath that we deserve. That is the gospel. That is what our salvation hinges on. And yet in this newness of life, we are called to action. It is not the action that brings us into newness of life. It is God's action that has brought us into newness of life. And now in response to what God has done, we need to live accordingly. In light of this new life that he has given us. And it should be our desire. We should make it our ambition to be pleasing to our Lord. If we love him, we will keep his commandments. And it's impossible to talk about righteous living. It is impossible to talk about being pleasing to the Lord with our lives. And to not talk about our speech. In fact, James mentions speech in every chapter of the book of James. And this isn't surprising considering your speech is the clearest revealer of your heart. If you want to know most what a person is like, listen to them. Your speech is the most revealing disclosure or the most revealer, the greatest revealer of your heart. One author stated, the tongue is the tattletale of the heart. And Jesus in Matthew 15, 18 says, but the things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and those defile the man. And the reality is that we have a speech problem because we have a heart problem. You can't separate the two. We have a speech problem because we have a heart problem. And God, in his word, has described our heart as being deceitful, as being wicked, as being hard to discern. And this is true for every person. None of us are off the, hurt, off the hook. Listen, there are some sins that you may not commit simply because you don't have opportunity. Right? There are some things where the evil is in our heart and we just merely don't have the opportunity to act on it. However, there are few limits on what you can or can't say. Our speech is so dangerous. There are no built-in restraints or boundaries for us with our speech. It flows from our heart and it comes out of our mouths. In scripture, the tongue is described as being wicked, deceitful, perverse, filthy, corrupt, flattering, slanderous, gossiping, blasphemous, foolish, boasting, complaining, cursing, contentious, sensual, and vile, and the list goes on. It's not even all of them. And all of this points to the problem in our hearts. 
And James being a book of practical instruction for Christian living is really a guide to walking in the newness of life that God gives. It's instruction to know what indeed is pleasing to the Lord, which should be each of our ambition. Do you feel the weight of this? If left to ourselves, we would have no hope And yet, because of Christ's mighty work, we have hope. We have hope in this. Our desire and love for God is to obey him and be pleasing to him. Well, what you are will show itself forth in what you say. Your speech is the thermometer to your spiritual warmth. And if you lose the battle for your speech, you have revealed that you have already lost the battle for your heart. One of our greatest aids and likewise one of our most dangerous hindrances to being pleasing to the Lord is our tongue. And each of us must vigorously Seek to honor God with our speech. Seek to honor God with your speech. Make a plan for how you're going to be pleasing to him. How are you going to guard your tongue with the purpose of being pleasing to him? What I want to do this week and next is I want to set before you from James chapter 3, six considerations for honoring God with our tongue. Right, That should be our desire, is to be pleasing to him with our speech, to not simply never speak again, although for many of us that would be better. But our desire should be to use our speech to bring honor and glory to him. And so this morning what we're going to do is we're going to address the first three considerations. So in seeking to honor God with my tongue, I must consider number one, The first consideration for me as I seek to honor God with my tongue is the role I assume in my speech. In seeking to honor God with my tongue, I must consider the role that I assume in my speech. The role I assume in my speech. Look at verse 1 and 2. Let not many of you become teachers. James begins his instruction on the use of the tongue with a warning against exercising authority over others with our words. Verse 1, let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that as such we will incur a stricter judgment, for we all stumble in many ways. James begins this section with a warning, let not many of you become teachers. What James has in mind here is not limited to an elder pastor position, although that would definitely be included. But it is more than normal body life, right? We are, we're all called to care for one another in the body of, of Christ. Romans 15 Paul says, I myself am convinced that you are full of all goodness, able to admonish one another. Colossians 3, we're called to teach and encourage and admonish one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And what James has in mind here is more than that, more than normal body life. But he's not, he's not restricting himself to only pastor elder. It's beyond that as well. James point here then is not to discourage people from communicating their scriptural insight or to hinder people who have a genuine good desire to serve others in teaching. There rather should be a careful consideration and a restraint for the believer in his speech before he assumes a role of teaching others. For each of us, there should be a consideration for the role that we're assuming as we are stepping out with our speech. What kind of position are we placing ourselves in before others? James isn't leveling an attack on teaching. He's seeking to restrain the rush to teach on the part of those not qualified. And it is for all of our good that those who are not qualified have restraints. He's speaking in relation to the body of Christ. You see he includes the phrase, my brethren, as he already has several times in the book. It's endearment. And those to whom James was writing would have had fresh on their minds the instruction that James has already given in chapter 1, verse 26. Turn just a little bit to the left. Look at chapter 1, verse 26. 
James, in speaking about practical Christian living and what things should look like in the body of Christ, he says, If anyone thinks himself to be religious and yet does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is worthless. It's worthless. If there isn't a bridle on your speech... We must be men and women who consider the role that we are assuming. If any Christian, if their religion, if their practice of their faith is worthless, if there isn't a bridle on their tongue, how much more for those who are instructing others in the faith? How much more then must those who are leading others in what is pleasing to the Lord be. They must be exemplary. We must be exemplary with our speech. And the issue James seems to be addressing here is not one of heretical teaching that must be immediately removed. If that were the case, he wouldn't have used language like my brethren, and the content wouldn't be a warning, but it would be a rebuke. James is seeking here to curb the danger of talkativeness, of reckless statements, of frothy rhetoric, of abusive language, of misleading assertions on the part of some of the members who seem to be quick to want to voice their opinion, who are quick to want to gain for themselves a following. It's the kind of people who, you know them, like to hear their own voice. And they're doing this all without careful consideration of their words. And so James says, listen, those who teach will be judged with a stricter standard. God will look more closely at those who are teachers when he judges. When was the last time you were being evaluated on something and you stopped the evaluator and said, hey, before you begin, I want to make sure that you judge me, that you evaluate me with a stricter judgment, with a stricter evaluation than all the rest. I don't know that I've ever done that. And yet when you step into a teaching role, you are volunteering before the Lord for stricter judgment in what you say. When you step out in a teaching role, you're stepping out in an authoritative role. And the fact of the matter is that when you assume a teaching role over others, you have influence over those people. You have influence over their thinking. You have influence over their action. Yes, they are accountable before the Lord, but you are accountable for what you instruct. And how are you steward such a responsibility, how I steward such a responsibility will be judged by God. And it will be done so with a more severe strictness. This should cause a pause for us. This this should cause a, a greater evaluation, a greater thoughtfulness. It shouldn't cause us to never want to share what we're encouraged by but it should make us rush to a thoughtful, prayerful consideration of how we are sharing, how we are holding our thoughts and our opinions, and the kind of integrity in which we are walking as we pass along those thoughts. So the first consideration you and I must make in seeking to honor God with our speech is considering the role we're assuming. We must understand that our words are powerful, And we are fully accountable for every word we say. And if we are presenting ourselves as a teacher of others, we are held to a stricter judgment. And we are all susceptible to sinning with our speech. No one is above this warning. Look at verse 2. James immediately follows this warning with, we all stumble in many ways. We all have moral lapses and failures in doing what is right, much less with our words. The imagery here is walking down a path, and the stumbling that takes place is not a falling off of the path. 
Rather, it's, it's stumbling on a rock and then having to pick yourself up and continuing down the path. And that's helpful in imagery. James isn't saying many turn away from their faith. No, he, he's saying we all sin, we all stumble, we all need to be picked up off the ground, much less with our speech. We fall individually and personally in many ways, and this is all the more reason for us to consider the role that we assume in our speech. You need to be uh, guarded, you need to be thoughtful, you need to be careful about assuming a role of authority over others because of what you know about your own personal sinfulness in many ways. Not only am I capable in my words of bringing destruction to myself, but I can very badly hurt others. And we know this. It seems our minds are oftentimes very quick to rush to all the ways that we've been hurt by others' words. And that's a reality. We are all, we're all sinners here, and we all have struggles controlling our tongue, applying this passage, it is inevitable that we're going to sin against and have sinned against one another with our tongues. We know this to be true, and we need to be ready to forgive. We need to not dwell on that. We need to not hold each other under that. We need to put away bitterness. We need to forgive. And then we probably, if we find ourselves constantly thinking about how all others have sinned against us, we probably need to recalibrate our thinking to think a little bit less about how others have sinned against us and to evaluate our own speech a little bit more because the reality is, is that we have sinned against others. And just to be clear, the remedy is not removing yourself from ever teaching another, the remedy is not simply to never speak, but it is to seek out and to be holy in your speech. What are some practical areas where it would behoove us to consider the role that we're assuming? What does your social media presence look like? And have you given consideration as to what role you are assuming in your use of social media? Now, I've been blessed tremendously by many of you and your use, and I would encourage you to excel still more. But if you have never given thought in your posting, uh, tweeting, or whatever you do, have, if you have never given thought, how am I presenting myself? I encourage you to. Not for the purpose of restraining anything that you would ever say, but rather for the consideration before the Lord to, to, hold, to hold yourself to what God has said, to go, I am going to be accountable before the Lord in this statement. And trust me, if you think that before every time you type something onto your computer, your computer presence will change. Some other areas to consider. The body of Christ. Your home. Your small group. There's much to consider here. And in seeking to honor God with my tongue, we must consider, number one, the role that we assume in our speech. Number two, second, in seeking to honor God with my tongue, I must consider the reality that is revealed by my speech. The reality that is revealed by my speech. Look at verse 2b. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well. What is the reality that is revealed in my speech? It's your spiritual maturity. Your spiritual maturity. Where, where, where do we see that? Look again at verse chapter 2. When James says he is a perfect man, we must understand what he means by perfect in this context. This word for perfect can have two meanings. It can mean perfect, meaning morally without fault. That's how we would typically think of the word perfect in the English language. But this can also mean mature, brought to maturity, like a ripe fruit that is ready to eat. It's complete it's mature, it's perfect, and James has used this word 
before in the book of James. Look back again at chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. I don't know if you've ever had questions about this passage as to what the perfection is that James is speaking of, but this might be helpful. In verse 2, he starts, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. James' instruction to consider trials joy is not so that we might forever be sinless. That day is coming. And it will come when Christ returns or when we go to meet him, when we die. But what James is getting at here is consider trials joy Because you know that the testing of your faith, it produces endurance in that faith. And the weak area of your life will be exposed in that trial. And God will use that to produce endurance, to grow you, to mature you, to bring you to a complete Christian life before him. The perfection here is not flawlessness, but it's being raised to maturity in your faith. In your following of Christ. And God uses trials to do that. And through trials, strengths of ours are put on display and weaknesses are put on display. And God uses those things to grow us and conform us more and more into Christ's likeness. To bring us to more and greater maturity in our faith. And so when you face trials, consider them joy. And James also uses this same word in chapter 2, verses 21 and 22. And here he's talking about the outward expression of our faith being confirmed in righteous living. Make no mistake, James does not at all petition that works is what produces faith. Rather, what he is driving home is that your faith produces an outward expression which justifies to all who are looking and to yourself the validity of your faith. And if there's no righteous living, then what you have put on display is a dead faith. And so in chapter 2, he appeals to Abraham. Look at verse 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac, his son, on the altar? And again, you might ask, justified by whom? And the, the answer to that question is not by God. Abraham was counted righteous before God far before he offered up Isaac on the altar. He believed God and that was counted to him as righteousness. Rather, Abraham's fullness of faith was put on display when he was willing to give up that which was most precious to him in his son. And so he was justified before onlookers in his own heart and before those who watched him when he offered up his son on the altar. In verse 22, you see that faith was working with his works, and as a result of works, faith was perfected. Well, what does James mean there? Was his faith perfect? No, he's saying his faith was matured. It was complete. He came face to face with the greatest cost of following God, and he willingly gave that up. And his faith was put on display as mature, as complete, So back to our passage in chapter 3, the idea is that the person who does not stumble in what he says gives evidence of a purified and a mature heart. Verse 2, if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man able to bridle the whole body as well. You see, as I said at the beginning, there is a reality that is revealed by your speech, and it is your own spiritual maturity. What you are will show itself by what you say. Your spiritual maturity will show itself by your speech. Verse 2 could also read, if anyone does not sin in what he says, he is a mature man. That is what is revealed by that person's speech. That is the reality that is revealed by your speech. It is your own spiritual maturity. And if you can control your speech, you have hope that your body will likewise follow. In your fight against sin, in your fight for self-control, we must start with the battle for our speech. And if you can control your tongue, you have hope in the battle for the rest of your body as well. 
To bridle your whole body means to restrain it and all its members, including the tongue, which is the hardest to restrain. And to bridle your body gives the imagery that if you were to leave yourself unbridled, your whole body would run into sin. The sinful inclinations and desires are there, and when left unrestrained, they rush to evil. You are your own worst enemy. I am my own worst enemy. One more time, turn back to chapter 1. Look at verse 13. Let no one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. When you're tempted to sin, what's the problem? Well, it surely isn't God. God is not the problem. Well, then what is the problem? Verse 14, but each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by what? His own lusts. His own strong desires, his own passions. When you go unbridled, your strong desires and your passions are left to run free. Bridle your tongue and you have hope to bridle your whole body and to not be carried away by your own lusts. So what does your speech reveal about you? This is a hard one. What does your speech reveal about your spiritual maturity? As you give consideration to the reality that is revealed in your speech, what holes in your life are brought to light that you need to repent of? And conversely, we should think, when you think about your speech, when I think about my speech, where is God's grace evident? Because if there was no bridling, there would be no good coming out of our mouths. If, if there was no grace in our lives, there would be no good. And where there is good, we must, we must give thankfulness, in thankfulness, give glory to God for his work. In seeking to honor God with my tongue, I must consider, number one, the role I assume in my speech. Secondly, I must consider the reality that is revealed by my speech. And lastly, in seeking to honor God with my tongue, I must consider the repercussions that flow from my speech. The repercussions that flow from my speech. Look at verses 3 through 5. Now, if we put the bits into the horse's mouths so that they will obey us, we direct their entire body as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so great and are driven by strong winds, are still directed by a very small rudder wherever the inclination of the pilot desires. So also the tongue is a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. What is the tongue like? What is the tongue like? Well, James gives two examples here that demonstrate the repercussions that flow from our speech. Here we see the power of the tongue. Next week, we're going to see the destruction of the tongue. This morning, we see the power of the tongue to control the trajectory of who we are. The first analogy James uses to demonstrate the repercussions that flow from our speech is the illustration of a horse in a bit. If I were to take you to a thousand pound animal and reach into my pocket and pull out a five inch long piece of metal weighing less than a pound and were to hand it to you and say, get control of that thousand pound creature, what would you think? Right. <laughs> It's amazing, and yet that's what people use. That's what they use to control creatures of that magnitude. And this is a very appropriate illustration as a bit sits in a horse's mouth. It rests on top of their tongue, and when attached to a bridle and reins, it is the means of a rider easily making that horse, well, sometimes easier than other, making that horse do whatever the rider asks. 
in controlling a horse's head, that rider has control over the entire body of the horse. You might have found this principle to be true yourself as you were driving and you're looking down the road and you see something and you start to swerve off the road. (laughs) It happens. It's the same for horses. Where their head goes, their body goes as well. It's the same for us in our speech. Where our speech goes, the rest of us will quickly follow. While the most rebellious, stubborn of horses can be controlled with the proper application of a bit, the most gentle and tameable, rideable horses can suddenly become uncontrollable when that bit is removed. So it is with us. So it is with us. To be pleasing to the Lord, we need our tongues to be under control, bridled, that the rest of who we are might follow. The repercussion of an unrestrained tongue is an unrestrained life, and yet the repercussion of a well-bridled tongue is a life with a body that is under control also. The next illustration James gives is that of a giant ship. It's a giant ship that is directed and steered by a small rudder. This also is what the tongue is like. And James' point, again, is that in comparison to the size of the vessel, which is huge and driven by strong winds, the rudder is very small. And yet this very small rudder can easily steer that ship wherever the inclination of the pilot desires. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body And yet it sets the trajectory for the rest of who you are. James's conclusion to these illustrations is that the tongue is a small part of the body, but it boasts of great things. Like a bit in a horse's mouth or a rudder of a ship, the tongue has the power to control the rest of us. It is master control for the whole body. James is making the point of the smallness of the tongue and the greatness of its effect. Thus to think we can say whatever we want and we can just spew out whatever words we desire, whatever comes to mind, and there be no impact, there be no repercussions, there be no significance, is utter foolishness. There are significant, significant repercussions to what flows out of our mouths. For the destruction of our own lives, leaving ourselves in ruin, and for the destruction of others. There are always repercussions. There are always consequences to what we say. And this can be for that which is pleasing to the Lord or for that which is offensive and sinful against him. Your tongue is capable my tongue is fully capable and dangerous, and able to leave a wake of destruction. It can tear down others. It can destroy families and relationships. It can lead to murder and war. And while there is much danger with our tongues, there is much opportunity with our speech. There's opportunity to be pleasing to God. With our speech, we can speak gracious words, kind words, edifying words, words that build up and don't break down, words that comfort, words that bless, words that encourage. And this is what we must cultivate. This is what we must seek to have, words of humility, words of gratitude, words of peace, words of holiness, words of wisdom. That's what we should strive after. 
these kinds of words can only flow from a heart that is not only indwelt by the Holy Spirit, but is wholly submitted to him. That's what we need. That's what we need. Is that you? How have you given intentional thought and prayer to your speech? What what grid do you have in place that helps you think about what and when you speak? What truths have you set upon your heart, have you renewed within your mind to remember that you can call upon to help inform you in your speech? God's word is full of them. Don't repay evil with evil, but overcome evil with good. A gentle answer turns away wrath. Don't don't answer a fool according to his folly. And on and on, God gives such helpful, good instruction. How have you intentionally gone after that instruction so that you might fortify yourself so that that with which you speak is pleasing to God, so that your tongue is honoring to the Lord? If your ambition is to honor God, we must battle and fight and claw to win the battle for our speech. I just have to take a moment. I've met with several people this last week. My small group. I am so thankful for the way that this church uses their speech, for the way that you use your speech to encourage, to bless, to build up, to spur on. It is such a joy and such a blessing to get to be around you. And I am so thankful for that. And yet we all can still grow, right? We all still need to grow. So take heart, Grace Bible Church. God's grace is present in you, in your speech, in your tongue. And let God's word reveal the areas of weakness where you need to be fortified and grow all the more your intentionality to go after the battle for your speech because it matters. And you've been enabled by God's grace to win that battle. We must echo the sentiment of David who in Psalm 39 states, I will guard my ways that I may not sin with my tongue. I will guard my mouth as with a muzzle while the wicked are in my presence. The only hope we have is the hope of an external presence in our lives, something outside of just us. And we have that hope because we know that if we are in Christ, we have been crucified with Christ and we no longer live, but Christ lives in us. We know that God has granted to us all things pertaining to life and godliness. We know that no temptation has seized us, but what is common to man? And with the temptation, there is a way of escape. And so if you are in Christ, we have hope in this battle. Whatever this last week has looked like for you, whatever this last day, month, year has looked like for you. If you are in Christ, you have hope in the battle for your speech. That is good news. However, if you are not in Christ, everything that I've said about what we should strive after is completely unattainable for you at this point. But it doesn't have to remain unattainable. God's offer of salvation, salvation from slavery to sin, salvation from condemnation under that sin is available to you if you will but repent of your sin and turn to him in faith and repentance. And an unbridled life living for every vain under the sun pleasure that your lusts and passions draw you to can immediately end, be cut off, and you can have purpose to live for the glory of God. 
to live for the glory of his name. You can have purpose beyond the fleeting, vain, passing pleasures of this world, and you can pursue that which is eternal, that which is truly satisfying, that which is lasting forever and ever, and that is a reconciled relationship to the creator of the heavens and the earth. If you are in Christ, you must remember that that is what you have been given. And if you are not in Christ, I plead with you. Nothing else compares with living under God's grace, reconciled to him, no longer enslaved to your own sin, your lusts, your passions, but living for him. He is our hope. Our hope for all of what we have looked at this morning, for salvation to have the new desires and for his grace to be able to execute those new desires, all is found in Jesus. And he is the one who will keep us. He is the one who will sustain us. He will hold us fast. Let's pray. and Then we'll stand and we'll sing again of the greatness of our God in keeping us. God, thank you for these words. Lord, I pray that we would recognize your love behind these words, that we would recognize your kindness in that you do not ask us to be and do that which is unattainable for us, but that you care for us and you enable us to be able to walk in obedience, and we recognize that our only hope is in you, and so we pray that you would help us, that you would help strengthen our desire to be pleasing to you in all areas of life, and especially in regards to our tongues, and that you would help us to consider the things that we must to fortify ourselves in our pursuit of holiness. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your kindness. We thank you for your goodness. We pray all of these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.